I come to this from kind of a different angle than I think a lot of people do. I, um, I come from philosophy and from psychology and from history. I've done tech stuff, and I've done a lot of business stuff, but the stuff I love is philosophy and history and, you know, psychology and physics. I, those things I love. And those are things that matter to me. Um, the title here is a little flam. I got a little flamboyant when I was making this. This is not just rah-rah. Okay. Um, you know, I mentioned briefly yesterday, the thing that really is important to me, thank you, the re- thing that's really important to me for Bitcoin is that the old currency model enforces the past. Bitcoin gives a chance for the future to be born. To me, that is the essential of all of this. The problem that we have in the current world is that we are living with space-age technology under Bronze Age rulership, and it is holding us back. We should be far more advanced than we are now. We're more than capable of it, and it's holding us back. Bitcoin gives us a way around it. It's a workaround about, of the old, again, it's Bronze Age model. Uh, I can explain that in detail if anyone wants later, but it's a Bronze Age model of rulership we've been living under, and it doesn't suit us anymore. It's not good for us. We need to move forward. So, all right, I'll just read this quickly to you. Um, this is what happens in commerce over time, and it happens again and again and again. This was written during the Scottish Enlightenment. Wealth and power have never been long permanent in any one place. They travel, travel over the face of the earth something like a caravan of merchants. Once they, when they arrive, everything is green and fresh. While they remain, all is bustle and abundance. And when gone, all is left trampled down, barren and bare. And that's the way it goes. This is one of the great examples of it. I'll try to point out some things for you here. This, if you can see up over, up over here, is Italy. Uh, you can see Venezia, Venice up there at the top. And these are the trading routes of the 1200s, 1300s, 1400s. And Italy became very, very rich. Venice in particular, if you go to Venice, you see all the beautiful old buildings, all the wonderful art. This is when it happened because Venice was a trading empire. And all kinds of stuff came in and out of Venice. And what came in and out was everything from the old Silk Road and everything from all of these routes from China and India and Persia and Arabia, all you can see it feeding into the Mediterranean over there. And Venice and also Florence and their port Pisa and a little bit of Genoa, they were the ones uh, that were getting all of this. All was coming through them to get to the rest of Europe, which is off to the left and the top there. So this is the situation they had. And then everything changed. In 1453, Constantinople, uh, Byzantium fell. Uh, all All of this here over the next few decades was cut off. It was gone. The Ottomans were killing nice Venetian boys, took their boats and killed them and threw them overboard or did worse. And pretty soon the Venetian boys didn't want to go on the boats anymore. And over a few decades, all of this changed and all of these routes, or nearly all of them, broke down. At the same time, something happened In Portugal, Vasco da Gama figured out how to get around the Horn of Africa, and all of a sudden they had a water route to get all the stuff from the Silk Road, all of it back into Europe, and it came through Portugal. And the Portuguese became very, very rich. And, of course, their neighbors, the Spaniards, got in on the deal. And you can see everything blue uh, is Portuguese, and everything red is Spanish. And they became the next centers of wealth. It moved from place to place. During the 1700s and the 1800s, Venice was abandoned. Venice was a wreck. It was dilapidated. It was poor. It was a wreck. Portugal, Spain were the place to be. That's where all the action was. And this happens time and time again. This is a chart from J.P. Morgan. I have quibbles with the way that they've done it. Italy should be on the bottom there. Uh, but it shows you the, the progress 
They call it, you know, reserve currencies. It's where most of the action was. It went from it, the Italians to the Portuguese to the Spanish to the, uh, the Dutch, the, the French around the time of Napoleon, uh, then Britain and now the U.S. It doesn't stay forever. It moves from place to place. This always happens again and again and again. And right now, we're being set up for another one of these. And if we work very hard, and if we are very true to ourselves, Bitcoin has a shot. Cryptocurrencies have a shot at being there when the old Silk Route gets cut off. Now, um, I don't want to explain this too much, but there are two centers of mass influence and wealth. That's a poor way to say it. But it's oil and currency. Oil may or may not last, but currency is bankrupt and in need of replacement. Most of you probably know these charts, so I'm not going to spend a good deal of time on them. You know, this is credit in the United States. Um, this is debt to GDP, where the brown and the black are really bad, and you see nearly all of them are centered in the West. Um, this is debt to GDP for all of these countries, which is, you know, ridiculous numbers, and these are probably very conservative numbers. Um, here's the point. The old model is poised to fail. Will it be a, a year? Will it be a decade? I don't know. I can't tell. I can't see behind the scenes well enough. I don't know where all the derivative, how all the derivatives will unwind when something happens. I don't know. I don't know what's going on behind the scenes at the central banks. I can't tell. I don't have a view. But at some point, mathematics matters. And at some point, these debts can't be paid. It's just, it's just numbers. I mean, world, world debt is somewhere north of $200 trillion. World GDP is somewhere around 60 or 70. It's not going to be paid back. Now, one way or the other, we're going to have problems. When that happens, it's very possible that wealth moves again, and it will move to a place that's better for average people. So what we have now is the old model poised to fail, and underneath it right now is forming a new model, which is cryptocurrency. We're very early. Okay? There's no guarantee we're going to succeed. There's a long, long way to go. But the core is here. The kernel, if you will, exists. Now, the thing to understand, and you can lose this sometimes in, con in your conversations on ideas and new business opportunities, is that cryptocurrency is an opposing world model to fiat. It's not just different. It, it's radically different. It came from cypherpunks. It came from people who, who had a very different worldview. It didn't come from some, some guy in Wall Street. It came from a cypherpunk. These are the two models of human organization. The one that we all know, that we all grew up with, is properly called structure primary, whatever. It's the hierarch hierarchical model of human organization. We have the big dude sits in the big building in the top of the hill and collects everybody's money and tells everyone else what to do. I mean, that's the model. We have either it was a prince or a king, or now it's a group of people who make the laws and collect everybody's money and tell everyone what to do and, you know, send people out to... to kill or die, and everything else. And this is the model, and we've all been raised to think that this is the way of the world. This is the way it, it goes. Cryptocurrency is a completely different model. It's this one over here. Cryptocurrency is direct person-to-person -person communication, interaction. Bitcoin isn't perfectly that model, but it's pretty close. It's good enough for an explanation. So here's the issue, and here's the issue to me. In this model over here, I have two primary problems that are really important to me. One is the information processing. The guy on the top gives an order to the guy behind, underneath him, and he gives an order to the guy underneath him, and there may be many more levels, and you can't get information up and down very well. For information processing, it's a horrible model. It's a terrible model. It's a command and control model, and it doesn't work very well. The other part is really important. That's the action of human will. Any kind of hierarchy 
is inherently opposed to change. This guy is enforcing on this guy is enforcing on this guy. To whatever extent it's enforced upon you, your action of will is reduced. And I will argue that that is bad for the human psyche. I will argue that it is bad for human evolution. and It stops it in its tracks. Okay? Um, the truth of the matter is, in this, the Bitcoin model here, everybody is fully engaged. We're also fully responsible, which is scary. Okay? But everybody is full, fully engaged. When you're on the right-hand side, you are less alive than you are on the left-hand side. And this is, to me, fundamental. This is crucial for human development. There's problems. I mean, on the, on the left side there, you're responsible for everything. There's no politician to blame, which is one of the secret appeals of politics. You know, it's always the blue party's fault or the red party's fault. It's not my fault, you see. You're exposed over there. You're on your own. If you screw up, you screw up. Well, you learn and you move on. You know, we all screw up anyway. Um, so the Bitcoin model is very different than the hierarchical model. And in my opinion, it's a far, far superior model, and we should be promoting it. This is just something I, I just kind of I kind of love, but I think it really does illustrate the uh, concept of a new culture forming underneath the old. Because you see here, this is somebody who is breaking with convention. I mean, you know, I'm an older guy. The mask, I think, is you know, a little silly. But then again, I did plenty of silly things when I was that age, too. Um, but the corrupt fear us. The honest support us. The heroic join us. These are a, it's a hell of a good set of moral ideas, of moral claims to make about oneself. And new cultures are built upon independent moral ideas that they have. So, anyhow, what we are facing, in my opinion, is this in the Bitcoin world. Which do we want to be? Do we want to be the old model or do we want to be with the Satoshi Nakamoto model? Which is the one we really want? Which is the one we want to be? Now, you know, this guy here... Well, he's got, a, he's got a system that has bottlenecks that sets up kind of a almost sort of monopoly um, that gets people to give away information that it, value that they don't really realize they have, that they think, they're, they think they are a customer when they're not. They're actually the product and gathers up everybody's information and is in bed with just about every organization of the old world that he can get into. Or we have the Satoshi Nakamoto model, which is this. So the question is, which one do we want to be? Um, I like to, I like some, I like a lot of Bible quotes, and I'm not selling religion or any kind of religion, but really anyone who doesn't think there's something interesting to be learned from the Bible really isn't trying. Uh, but there's two things that, I, that just leap to my mind. Uh, one from the Old Testament that says, one of the prophets says, how long are you going to limp between two opinions? If the Lord's God, serve him. If the other one's God, serve him. Pick one. And I think we need to have one of these two models that we care about. But however you choose to work within it, however you choose to help it develop, we need one or the other. And the other one I like to use is from the New Testament where he says, if I build again those things that I also destroyed, I make myself a transgressor. So, again here, which one do we want? And if I want the left-hand model, I really don't want to be building in the right-hand model. If we have to take middling steps, then we take middling steps. But you've got to really know where you're going and which one you want. All right. Now, leaving philosophy and getting more back to practicality, we're still a small group. We're still a small market. And cryptocurrency really needs to grow up. Now, we are growing up. But it's something that I think we need to pay attention to. Bitcoin is not magic. We're not going to get by in Satoshi's coattails. We're not going to get something for nothing. We 
have to work. We have to make this happen. The blockchain is a wonderful technology, and I'm really, really pleased we had it. But it's not perfect. We have to make the thing work. It was a, a gift from Satoshi Nakamoto, whoever he, she, or they may be. God bless him and thank you. I mean, seriously, really thank you. Um, but it's up to us to make the thing work. That's just, that's just a piece of software. We have to build everything around it. We have to make it work. So, talking about cryptocurrency growing up. Getting rich is not a mature model. Getting rich quick, rather. I didn't like the big price spike in 2013 because I thought it kind of gave the wrong message. I like the price going up. That's always very pleasant. But I want a nice, smooth rise. I don't want people here in the Bitcoin space who are thinking, get rich quick, because it's the wrong model. Then we're not, and you know, we may, I, you know, it may happen again. We may get a spike to, you know, half a million dollars. I don't know. Um, I hope so, but slowly, please. Um, but that's not the model. We're talking about a mature technology. If we really want to be the place to go as fiat cracks and burns, we have to be mature. We have to be the adults. We have to be the people that are solid, that know what we're doing. Okay? Excitement is great, and you shouldn't give up your excitement, but it's not enough for the long haul. Cryptocurrency needs to grow up. Well, if you got a guy who's an average 60-year-old guy who owns a business, turns over $10 million per year. Maybe he runs a grocery. Maybe he's a plumber. Maybe he's whatever, builds something. The people that make things that we really use in our daily life, not guys who get a skim on, on numbers that pass through their, their computer screen. People that really build things and make things. When is it that that man is going to turn, turn his company over and make it Bitcoin primary? I don't have a great answer for you, but that's the point we need to hit. We need to have this 60-year-old man who's been working for 40 years and is trying to save up money for the future and is worried about his grandkids. This is the guy that we need to get in. We need to have him comfortable getting into the Bitcoin market. We're not there now. We can get there, but it's going to be work. It's going to be hard. Um, when does the average 80-year-old grandmother put her retirement money in it? There comes a point when that happens. We need to get there. We need to be solid. We need to be reliable. Um, there should be, in my opinion, and maybe somebody's working on it and I don't know about it, a cryptocurrency merchant bankers association. Credit, although horribly abused underneath the current system, is a fundamental part of any functional economy. It's almost like a recycling system. How many people now have... 20 or 50 Bitcoin sitting in a wallet doing nothing with it? I don't know, thousands. What if there was a cryptocurrency merchant banking association? And I mean a bunch of gray-headed men and women sitting around a table, people who have made loans and had them fail and have made loans and where they created a beautiful business. And they've done both and they have experience, they've taken their blows and they know how to go between the two and they're not working with fiat. They're working just with cryptocurrency. We need this. It's a recycling system. It keeps our currency moving. It keeps wealth going. It's a fundamental part of any, any economic ecosystem. And as far, so far as I know, uh, we really don't have it. And there's problems. It's not going to be easy. There's issues. None of this is easy. As one of my old bosses used to say, son, if it was easy, anyone could do it. Okay? It's not easy. But we need this. Um, and there's problems. Uh, you know, it, what about this, this forking threat that's supposedly with us now? I don't want to get into all the details. I haven't followed all the details because I have too many things to do. But according to what I've heard, one of the, the people that want to do the fork with the, the bigger block size and everything else says also, well, when it's all done, you know, I can just be the benevolent dictator of, you know, of the Bitcoin, of the Bitcoin program. Uh, to which my response is, fork off. That's, I mean, you know, I know it's kind of cute, but that's really what I mean. Fork off and wither because anybody who 
wants to have a benevolent dictator of Bitcoin really doesn't understand Bitcoin. And go ahead and go. You know, go in peace. Goodbye. See ya. Um, we have to also cooperate with the digital gold currencies and with the stackers, you know, the guys who have all their, all their coins and, you know, put them up on the shelf. Um, we should cooperate with those guys. Some of them maybe not, don't want to cooperate with us. They see us as competition. But we're, you know, too close. We should tr try to cooperate with these people and do things with them. They have a lot of value. These are people who, to some very significant extent, are willing to think independently. You know, they may be locked into, emotionally locked into an old model. Well, maybe we can help them get out of it a little bit and just expand a little bit and cooperate with these people. Um, and there are threats. You know, what I have here, what happens when the lords of fiat block Bitcoin traffic? And let me tell you what I mean. Bitcoin eats fiat's lunch. All day, every day. It's better. Not perfect. There's things we have to fix. There's things we have to build. But it pretty much eats fiat's lunch every day. But there's a couple things that fiat is really, really good at. They have a couple advantages that remain. Number one is they're really good at violence. I mean, they're really good at violence. They, are, they and their partners, the governments, and you know, the line between central banking and governments is... We can argue about it, but it's not, it's not, uh, it's not very wide. Um, and what happens if Bitcoin really does become big, if we do get solid, if we do mature, if we can get all the gray heads to trust us, what happens? Are they just going to give up? They got a monopoly on the creation of currency. They skim from it as it's being made. They're not going to give this up, and they're very, very good at violence. Now, I don't think they're going to necessarily, you know, come try to shoot us all. I don't want to get too, too dramatic. But they're not just going to go away either. And they also have another advantage, is that they or people who are very closely associated with them own all of the physical infrastructure. They own the cables. They own the routers. I mean... AT&T, Verizon. I mean, when's the last time you've seen those guys tell the feds to take a hike? Not very often. So what happens when they get a new generation of routers that can block traffic based upon protocol? And what happens if they feel seriously threatened? Okay. We can work around it. We're at least as smart as they are. We're much more adaptable than they are. But we're going to have to work. It's going to be hard. I mean, are we really, re are really willing to be like the marijuana dealers were for 30 or 40 years? I mean, there's not a town in the Western world, probably anywhere in the world, where you can't buy marijuana if you want it. And it's totally illegal in most places still. But there are always people who were willing to do this and who did it, and it was always available. Are we willing to go to the underground model? Do we really believe in what we're doing that much? Or is it just, you know, cool thing and convenient? So... Are we willing to suffer for it? I mean, where's Charlie Shrem? He's still in jail. All he did was transfer, uh, exchange some bitcoins for somebody who exchanged them to somebody else who bought something voluntarily on a system that probably had some, you know, had some products that were technically illegal on it. He's in jail. It's ridiculous. But there's, we have to decide if we're willing to face those issues to build something new, to go against the status quo, to build something that threatens the status quo, especially when they're starting to get hurt, when fiat starts to crack or crash or whatever it is that happens. We got to think about these things in advance. Probably won't happen to us. Odds are very low. But, you know, it's something we need to think about. Fundamentally, do we have a why? Why? Do we have a why for this that's more than just, I want to have, you know, I want to lay on the beach? Right? Laying on the beach gets pretty old after about a week, by the way. It's really not as cool as you think it is. But we all need our reasons. Mine, I think I stated fairly clearly here, what my reasons are why I want Bitcoin to work. Um, other people have their own. Uh, the African gentleman who spoke yesterday, 
he has what I think are really great reasons. He wants to get the people who live in these little villages to be brought in to uh, an economic system where they can thrive. Gosh, I think that's a wonderful reason. You have the voluntarist sort of reason when they say, look, coercion is wrong. It's bad for humanity. It's wrong no matter who does it. It's wrong no matter what kind of badge they, ha- they have on or what kind of costume they wear. It's wrong. And Bitcoin is something we should look at because it doesn't enforce that upon us. That's a good reason, in my opinion. But we all need to have some kind of reason as to why we want to do this beyond just make a couple of bucks. It's more than that. This is something new. It's something important. And again, I think it's important for human evolution. Seriously. I do. So we all need to understand why. So when things are hard, when things are difficult, when things may be scary, we need to know why. Because fundamentally, we are making the future. It's not somebody else. It's us. We're here. Either we make the future or other people make it for us. Thank you very much. Thank you, Paul. Uh, We have a few minutes for questions, so if we have anybody like to ask Paul any questions about uh, maybe uh, uh, anything at all, but... uh, I'll make I'll make a plug, and I have a couple of questions too. So if any if you think of anything, raise your hand at any moment. But I've got a couple. But first, I just want to say, uh, freemansperspective.com, dot com. Correct. Uh, this is one of his current projects where he talks about these things um, from a philosophical level on a regular basis. It's one of my favorite reads. It's very different from the typical things you see online, as, as uh, Justin Newton mentioned yesterday, where everyone writes short 400-word articles with catchy headlines that are just a trap to get you to click. Um, Paul's stuff actually has substance, and you can – I, I liken it to on a Sunday morning, you print out his article, you can put your feet up on the couch, print it out, don't look at it on your computer screen, and – and just enjoy it and think and ponder and, and, and go through these things. So it's a great, a great publication. So th- there's um, my recommendation for that. Um, a question I have for you is you've been in and around the cypher, cypherpunk movement for a long time. And obviously this is a tool for self-defense and we have to take ownership of it, be responsible. Um, but, you know, you've, you've, you've been around the block a few times. You've seen... The, the false starts and the ups and the downs, the victories and the losses. Can you share some of those with us um, as to, you know, just your perceptions? How can we avoid making some of those same mistakes that happened in the past? Okay, sure. Um, one of the real things uh, uh, that have oh, been problems in the past is there was one guy who was running it, and there was one group, and then they got clicky, and then there was a lot of ego involved. And it's, you know, no, no, I'm the big guy. I get to decide what's this going to be. And um, unfortunately, when you get people who are publicly famous, even if it's famous to a fairly small group, it doesn't help their character development. Let's put it that way. And people, there's a lot of problems. The great thing about Bitcoin, and God bless Satoshi, whoever he may be, because he made the thing and he went away. And the exciting thing about Bitcoin, I mean, the technology is great. And I really like it. I think the blockchain is a very cool idea. I love it. But the really important thing about Bitcoin is the community. We have several thousand people who get up every day and want to make this thing work. And they're all over. I was just in Europe at a conference. And we had a couple of hundred, mostly young people there who are getting up every day and trying to figure out what to do with Bitcoin, maybe to do a little 3D printing on the side, maybe to do all these things, and they're involved and they're engaged. This, to me, is what really matters. The technology is wonderful. It's a great tool. But when you have whatever the number is, 2,000, 8,000, 10,000, I don't know what the number is, of people who get up every day and who get it and who want to make this thing work, gosh, that's powerful. And we didn't have that in the movements, the various ones I was involved with, you know, back in late 90s or 2000s or everything else. We didn't have that. And there were single points of failure. 
You know, there was one office. There was one guy. There was one group. And there was a single point of failure. Well, what, what Bitcoin has done, I mean, Mt. Gox failed. This was, if there was a single point that could have been the point, it failed. Well, what happened? Well, a lot of people had a good cry over it. But then they got up and went back to work. And that's what happens in real life with things that succeed. Yeah, everybody gets kicked. Everybody makes mistakes. Everybody screws up here and there. But when these people get back up and go back to work, oh, that's when we really got a chance to go somewhere. And that's what I see in Bitcoin now. Yes, sir. Right, let me bring the mic to you so you can say it in the mic. I don't have one. <laughs> We're going to talk about that. That's one of my questions. Um, you're hearing a lot in the last calendar year um, from a contingent in the Bitcoin community to do away with the idealism of many of Bitcoin's enthusiasts and move more toward, I'm not exactly sure yeah. how to kindly describe it, because um, I fall in the idealist camp, I guess. What's your take on that um, as Bitcoin matures? It sounds like you're saying we, we need that con contingent, the idealists. We definitely around. need the so idealists. So where does it come from, this camp saying, you know, what's, what's going on with the camp saying that that needs to go away or to the fringes more again? And, um, you know, what's going on there and where do you fall? Okay. Well, first of all, I'm squarely in the idealist camp. Uh, I, I think ideas matter. I think philosophy matters because philosophy rules men's mind, and therefore it rules the world. Uh, whether we see it or not or understand it or not, that's, that's the essence of it. We are thinking beings. Um, where it comes from, and I'm not speaking about everybody, and this is just my opinion, it's very scary to spit on the king. It's very... Uh, it takes what we're talking about, all of these things, going with the new model instead of the old model. We make a mistake when we think we can just get people to come to it by showing them charts and graphs. Because to break with the status quo doesn't require intellectual strength as much as it requires emotional strength. And we are people who want to hang on a little bit to the old model. There are also people who think they can make a lot more money by working with the old model and bringing this into it now that it's famous because the price spiked to 1100 or 1200 whatever it was, and everyone said, oh, this is a good way to make a lot of money fast, which, you know, always appeals. And we got people in here who are saying, okay, we can work with this, and we want it to be accepted. We want it to be, you know, accepted over here and over here and over here, and we can get a lot more volume coming coming in. You know, look, it's a free world, or it should be. You know, go do what you want. It's not, you know, it's not my position to tell anyone they can't. But I think it is ultimately a detriment to Bitcoin. Bitcoin is a different model. It's a different thing. And there are a lot of people who are very strongly tempted to do go half measures. And I understand. I, I, I get it. But ultimately, we really need to go new model and let the old model go. Excellent. Other questions? Um, I have a question for you. Uh, you come from uh, a background of understanding the power of the king and, um, and the surveillance state that we live under. So my question is uh, twofold. First is, is that model, is, is that war lost, the war of privacy? And then the second question is, um, can Bitcoin help in that regard in any way? And in what way could it help, maybe directly or indirectly? So. Okay. Um, the war on privacy is never lost. However, we are dangerously close to losing the Internet as it is. The Internet is now, not will be, is now a surveillance system. That's what it is. I'm sorry to say it, but it's true. It's a surveillance system. Not only that, but they are beginning to deliver custom environments, which means everyone knows this. You go to, your, uh, to a YouTube page and your neighbor goes to a YouTube page and you get different content. Just when you YouTube.com and pull it up. 
And God only knows it's way, 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 way worse on Facebook. It's way worse within Google. That's what they do these days. And when you are, when they are harvesting all of your information, which they do, not I'm talking about the whole complex. Google, Facebook, they're the worst offenders. The NSA is even worse than them, I suppose. Um, the British governments are doing it. The Russians are doing it. The Chinese are doing it. Everybody's getting in on the bandwagon because they can make a lot of money with it. If they know what you're thinking, and then if they can deliver to you a custom environment, they can guide your thinking. And this is where the Internet's going. And when you mix in big data and computers doing things on their own, the Internet is almost, as it, it's almost lost to these organizations. And there's stuff going on behind the scenes, standards groups that are setting up um, uh, something called BGP-SEC, which is uh, it's complicated to explain, but essentially gives all the keys for everybody to a central authority, which is, by the way, very, very, very close with the U.S. State Department, apparently. And um, they can take down a continent or take down a single website when this new model is, is working. So, but there are always ways around it. Okay? Again, we are as smart as they are, and we are far more adaptive and far quicker. There are always ways around it. If we have to go to local mesh networks and packet radio, and does anyone besides me remember FidoNet? Okay, we got some guys who remember FidoNet. It worked, didn't it? FidoNet was okay, high latency, but it worked. Um, we, if we have to go the ba- back to that, then have a good cry, and we go back to it. Okay? So privacy is never lost. The current system is a real, real problem. Um, no matter what you do, uh, remember you have to act to protect yourself because it really is a surveillance system. Uh, Bitcoin's role is, I think, wonderful. I mean, Bitcoin is completely transparent. It's, one, it's like having an RFID chip in your wallet. Um, but if you take just some minimal effort, you can make, you can separate real identity from pseudo-identity. And you can do it if you wish with Bitcoin. And you can maintain the privacy aspect that you want. And Bitcoin, you know, again, is just a wonderful tool for so many things. But you must act to make these things happen to maintain the value of Bitcoin in a full surveillance environment.